pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the Bryan Board of Public Affairs meeting for May 5th, 2015. First item on our agenda is to approve the minutes of the April 21st, 2015 meeting. I see nothing wrong in it. I'll make a motion. Second. Al? Yes. Karen? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Jim? Yes. Number two, a hearing of public concerns. None will move on. Number three, a resolution to recognize National Drinking Water Week, May 3rd through the 9th, 2015. This will be resolution number 18, 2015. I'll ask Norm to read it, if you would. It's a resolution, excuse me, I'm sorry. It's a resolution recognizing National Drinking Water Week, May 3rd through the 9th, 2015, and the essential role water plays in our daily lives and the ways consumers can get to know their H2O. Whereas water is essential to our daily lives and our health, and whereas only tap water delivers public health protection, fire protection, support for our economy, and the quality of life we enjoy, and whereas we are all stewards of the water infrastructure upon which future generations depend, and Whereas each citizen of our city is called upon to help protect our source waters from pollution, to practice water conservation, and to get involved in local water issues by getting to know their water. Now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Public Affairs of the City of Bryan, Ohio, and majority of its members thereto concurring, that the week of May 3rd to 9th, 2015 be designated National Drinking Water Week in order to increase awareness of the essential role water plays in our daily lives and the ways consumers can get to know their H2O. And that our community joins with the American Water Works Association and more than 4,700 other public water systems in the United States to celebrate National Drinking Water Week. That this resolution shall be in full force and effect at the early period provided. Excellent. You have any other comments on that one? Um, we did a video last year. Uh, we're going to bring that back to life this year. Uh, what do you know about H2O? Who's got it queued up here? And, and, uh, so we'll first. queue it up and we'll look at the uh, passage of the resolution first, if that's okay with the board. I'd like to make a motion we approve resolution 18. Second. Jim? Yes. Al? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Karen? Yes. It's not in high def? Oh, we went in HD, because hmm. that won't be uh, very good. This was a tour we did of our water pool. What do you know about H2O? Not just any H2O. What do you know about your drinking water? No, not the bottled water from the store, but the water you get from your tap. Have you ever wondered where it comes from or how it gets to your home? Or what is done to it to make sure it is safe to drink? Learn more about your H2O. Follow along on the journey your drinking water takes through Brian's water system. Brian's water supply comes from seven wells located within the city limits. The wells range from 120 to 147 feet deep into the Mishindo Glacial Aquifer. The water quality from this aquifer is very good and requires little treatment. The city's wells have a combined capacity of nearly 8 million gallons per day. Under normal conditions, only three wells are used at a time to satisfy daily needs. The well pumps are powered by electric motors ranging from 15 to 40 horsepower. The water is pumped through underground pipes to the water treatment plant. The current treatment plant began operation in 1973. Its primary function is to remove iron from the water. The well water arrives at the plant and immediately passes through an aerator. The aerator converts the naturally occurring 
dissolved iron in the water to a solid that can be filtered out. An additional benefit of aeration is that it promotes the release of hydrogen sulfide gas from the water. After passing through the aerator, the water falls into a 1 million gallon reservoir. Disinfection is added as the water enters this reservoir to ensure the water is safe to drink. The water is held in this reservoir until it is needed. The next step in the treatment process is pumping the potable water from the reservoir out to the distribution system. To achieve this task, one 200 horsepower motor is used to lift and push the water through sand and gravel pressure filters that trap the iron. Upon leaving the water treatment plant, the finished water travels through nearly 70 miles of underground pipes to your homes, businesses, and more than 550 fire hydrants across the city. Additionally, any water that is not being consumed automatically fills Brian's two water towers. These towers have a combined capacity of 1.4 million gallons. When the towers are full, pumps at the water plant automatically shut off. While the pumps are off, water comes back out of the towers to supply the underground system. These towers also provide additional water for periods of high demand like firefighting. In 1982, a laboratory was added to the water treatment plant. Lab analysts are tested and certified by the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. They collect samples and perform water quality tests daily. Routine tests include pH, chlorine, iron, and bacteria. The lab analysts also perform testing for nearby communities and private water systems. Your entire water system is operated by highly trained state certified personnel. They have a great responsibility and take great pride in delivering safe drinking water to you. Thank you for watching. Now we hope you know a little more about your H2O. Very good. A um, couple of things, the aerator air that was on the video, um, Norm's cruise, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the first time that we undertook That's replacing the media ourselves. Are you going to give us a little heads up on how that went for you guys? Yeah, last time uh, we, um, we allowed it uh, to go nine years, uh, we had no idea how long of life we were going to get out of the media. Um, we found that we probably would have been better to change it a little sooner. So this time we changed it six years. And the first time we did it uh, <coughs> six years ago, um, we hired a contractor to help with that. Um, this time we, we kind of knew what we were in for. So the gentlemen that were, are working there, we all agreed to try it ourselves. And three days we had an empty new, new uh, media put back in. And back up and running, and um, we believe we saved about thirteen thousand dollars by doing it with in house people. Um, that media is still sitting in dumpsters waiting on the lab analysis before we can land fill it, but that's just a formality. And, uh, so it looks like six to seven years is about the life of, of the, the media um, before it starts to um, really clog up with iron deposits and calcium. We didn't have any of it stuck together this side with calcium like we did before, but we did have some heavy iron deposits. And then I, I, I dropped this on Norm at the last minute, so I was not expecting to be super prepared for this, but because it's uh, National Drinking Water Week and we have been yeah. performing a water study, right. I guess I'm, I want you to explain what we're actually doing with this water study and what kind of results are we looking for or what, what's the bigger picture on it? Well, what's going on right now, the, the new software uh, is up and running and with our data in it from before as far as a hydraulic analysis model of our aquifer um, that um, it sort of had to be reconstructed from, I forget how many years ago now, when they did the original wellhead protection plan. Um, we, they are working on calibrating the model. They're seeking more information, which we just supplied them this past Friday with quite a bit more information on uh, the wells at the solar field, the, the pump data from that, from when we first uh, um, were investigating that, and we did some 24-hour pump tests. Also, Derek and the crew spent two months gathering pumping water levels from our current seven wells. Um, we exercise those on a rotation basis 
so it takes about a month to get a true picture by the time you get through all seven wells you, um, and what the water level is while it's running. Um, so we got two months of data collected for them, for those all seven of them and submitted to the consultants this past Friday. So that's more information they'll put in the model. Also, the EPA has kind of changed the way they look at our, um, or calculate our time of travel zone. Um, they want it recalculated for new wellhead protection plans anyhow. They're going to look at the capacity of the water treatment plant. Not so much what you're pumping today, but what you're capable of pumping. Our average is 1.4 million gallons per day. Our plant capacity is rated at 5 million gallons per day. So there will be new information drawn and new time of travel zones notated based on a 5 million gallon per day withdrawal rate instead of just 1.4 or 1.5. We're trying to gather a little more information for them on, on the irrigation wells, and, and uh, that's going to take a little time, uh, but we are gaining information there too. And on the irrigation wells, you and I have talked about this. It's not that as a utility or stewards of our system that we're against the irrigation wells. That's correct. We just have to figure out how we can work with our, our agricultural uh, people around us, our farmers around us, that have these wells, how we can work together to make sure that each helps each other and we don't hinder each other. So that report that we're looking for is going to give us some of that data. Am I correct? Oh, I believe that? so, too. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll give us uh, that data as well as it might give us, uh, or should give us points that, that might, we might, uh, oh, what do you call it? Uh, let's, let's, watch the water table and if it ever gets to say this point that's sort of an alert okay. maybe a cause for concern and if it never reaches that point then maybe everybody's happy and we're all good and and, and we'll move on but uh, it should it should identify some some drawdowns like that 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 might be cause for concern is there potential benefits to have in these agricultural so, wells so, north of us versus a you know the yeah. scary part that they're there. Yeah, some of the benefits it, it can change the flow path of, of the underground water, and you know the the landfill northwest of us is no secret. It's always been a little bit of a concern of people downstream. Um, potentially, one of them could be an interceptor well that would divert any kind of plume away from the city. Um, instead of allowing it to pass on through. That's um, stuff that hopefully this, this study would, would identify and create scenarios. So it be a true partnership then mm -hmm. with the ag community? Excellent. And the question We all depend on it. Nobody, even, I don't know, nobody wants to contaminate their own water, I'm sure. Any other questions or comments? The video is still good. Yeah, yeah. Really is. Well is that showing on TV this week at all? On channel three or four? I, or is it up I for did want to point out it is available yeah. on our website. Yeah. At the, on the drinking water page and available to look at. Um, there was a QR code in the newspaper <coughs> ads that ran this week that okay. linked to this page so people can get to know their H2O. Uh, in addition, there's some text there that tells about what the constituents, the iron, the calcium, the fluoride, the hardness of the water is. So it's worth a visit for people to get to know their drinking water. Should it we, is good, yes. Should we maybe uh, post it on the Facebook page as well since this is the week? Uh, we did earlier, we did. but okay, I missed we it. can post it again. Do we have it on our YouTube page now? Uh, this video probably is from the past. Okay. Well, we know how critical it is after seeing what happened in Toledo last year and what's going on in California right yeah. now. Well, I, I was just going to say, uh, I read a news article on my computer the other night that kind of caught my eye. Uh, and I don't even remember what news source it was, but they were predicting uh, 
water shortage is similar to what they're seeing in Southern California and I guess parts of Texas over the next, mm -hmm. I think it was 25 years. And there was only five of the, well, the 49 states or 48 states, uh, continental mm -hmm. states, uh, that they said probably wouldn't, wouldn't see the shortage and Ohio was one mm -hmm. of them this, in the, this area. So we need to take care of that. Okay, right. yeah. Well, that's one of the things we should be trying to sell industry to come here is we have water. water. Yeah. yeah. Good water. You can have water, but if it's not quality, forget it. Mm -hmm. It does taste good. I'm sitting here drinking our water right now. I don't have to go out and buy bottled water. I'm not afraid of that. It doesn't taste much different anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're more regulated than the bottle. Water. There you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. Yes. Good job, Norm. Thank you, Norm. Good Thank point, you. Norm. Thank you, Norm Allen. Number four, a resolution to authorize a farm rental agreement for the Bryan Industrial Park North. Okay, this will be resolution number 19, 2015, a resolution to authorize a farm rental agreement with, and I will butcher this name, Nor Ashton Limited LTD for Bryan Industrial Park North and declare an emergency. So what we have in front of us is a one-year contract with the Rashton Limited, which is actually the Eshelman family. Okay, and um, we worked with the Eshelman family because they were neighbors to the property to begin with, and um, and we have been working with them quite a bit on getting well data because they have a lot of these wells. So it's it's a, it's a good relationship. We've mutually agreed upon, if approved, um, soybeans this year. Uh, you know, we always had the intent of doing an alfalfa or low cover crop. Um, due to the fact that the field previously last year was a lot of corn, you know, we do no-till. It's rather difficult to do no-till on corn stubble, so we need a year, another year of that corn stubble breaking down. Now, um, if the property is sold, you know, we realize that this group has a, an expense on the table, and, and the contract, if you read, would be, you know, just recovery with receipts. So it's, it's a good deal. And then um, future needs of the property will be addressed on an annual basis. You know, so if it makes sense to do X, we will recommend that to you, but we'll run the numbers first to bring it to you guys to see what, what makes sense. So questions on this? I think that's a good use of, of that property for now. I agree. They might as well put to use until mm -hmm. we and they realize that we've got just one year until year to year. Yep. Okay. I'll make a motion. Second. Al? Yes. Karen? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Jim? Yes. Okay. Five then is to affect semi monthly disbursements. I'll make a motion we pay the bill. Second. Jim? Yes. Karen? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Al? Yes. And number six is comments from BPA and staff. Director? Okay, a couple things. Just for light discussion purposes, I'm, I'm going to go through them and then if Joe wants to in, interject to, I'm going to have him hop up. So this weekend, um, we did experience some difficulties in the communications world or department. Pay-per-view for the big fight this weekend nationally went down. Okay. So BMU had, had several customers that purchased and experienced the difficulty, or excuse me, the package, and they also experienced the difficulty of it going down, and we wanted to apologize to those customers. But again, that was beyond our scope of control. I mean, what we had was you know, right in front of us. Um, I know Joe has worked with those customers to try to get a refund and do some other things to help them out. But again, it still doesn't help the fact that you know they wanted this product and we couldn't offer it because nationally everything was going awry. On top of that, we also want to give you a heads, uh, heads up. Our UPS, our backup power supply, over the weekend at the same time failed in our head end. So Joe and the crew spent some time getting that back up and running. Um, we are looking at replacing it. It's, it's a needed thing. It sort of conditions the voltage and picks up if something happens to the electrical system. So that unit is down. Um, Joe's already exited on top of getting a replacement or getting some quotes and replacements. And the third thing that was sort of beyond our scope again was our digital service provider, which is HITS. Um, as Joe said, in his many years in the business, had, has never been 
around a group like HITS that had a piece of equipment fail. They normally have backup to backup and they experienced a digital piece of equipment failure which took our digital package down on our full system for approximately four hours, Joe. Is that what we estimate? So again, we want to apologize to our customers, again, beyond our control. You know, we, this is a service we buy ourselves to help push back through to our customers. And I know Joe worked with the HITS group to figure out what went on. And just was a very busy weekend for those guys. That staff was hopping all weekend. So um, Joe and I talked. We wanted to take the opportunity to just, again, apologize. You know, beyond our control, a lot of this. But again, you know, we were, we're going to run it on our shoulders and move on. Um, Joe, anything you want to add to that? No, just simply that the HITS outage affected all the operators in the United States that use that service. So it was several hundred thousand customers across the country. It wasn't just us. So? Their main controller went down, which never happened. And not only did it go down, they had a lot of trouble figuring out what caused it and what the real problem was. So again, if, if there are customers out there that are still upset, please call us. I mean, we can't fix what's beyond our scope, but if you want to chew, feel free to call out, okay? <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to briefly go over uh, a little more in depth, and there's a lot of stuff here I want to read on uh, to you folks, uh, net neutrality. It's the what the FCC had just passed several months back, and we've been talking about it or leading to it. So I'm going to give you a, I asked Joe to put together a really nice summary. Um, so Joe did, and we went through and pulled out. I went through and pulled out some of the information. I mean, Joe, it was a two, three-page report you put together for me. So just give me a chance to read this real quick, and then we'll take some questions. So this rule is known. The net neutrality is known and known by and referred by several names. They call it Title II net neutrality, open internet rules, and as Joe stated, often mix two or more of these together. It's the same rule. Um, the main purpose of this rule by the FCC was to reclassify broadband internet service providers, the communication side, not the TV video side, to, uh, for a private entity to be regulated by what they call Tier 2 regulations. And the history behind the Tier 2 regulations, it's an 80-year-old rule that was originally implemented to regulate and control the telephone industry. Um, for some of us that are older, the Ma Bella days of telephone and their expansion. What are you trying to say? I'm just throwing it out that we are old and that's where some of this came from, okay? So what this basically does is to classify broadband providers as a utility. And now they have to operate, we or they, have to operate under those regulations. So one of the provisions, or some main, pro uh, some main provisions in this ruling, they call it the new rules to protect an open internet. Okay, that's the whole premise behind it. The open internet is where this all segued into. So they want to um, three specific practices that they consider to harm an open internet are blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization of bandwidth. So here at BMU, our company, we don't participate in throttling or paid prioritization of bandwidth. We don't have um, Netflix or somebody pay us a fee or we, we throttle them back or force them to pay more money for us to push them through our system. Mm -hmm. That's, we don't do that. Um, we also don't do not throttle the internet, but we do manage bandwidth. And I know that sounds like a, a, something talking backwards here. So we ban we manage the bandwidth in such a way so that all our customers can have the same experience and same availability of data usage. And we manage this by a piece of equipment called a Procera. Okay. So. Part of the problem we run into, and the reason why this piece of equipment was brought on several years back was you know, over the past few years, video streaming has grown at an exponential rate and has been using more and more bandwidth up. And we know that because as we're buying and securing more capacity connections with Ethernet connections to the world or OC3 connections, every couple of years we're trying to upgrade that, okay? Um, at our company, due to our small size and the capital investment you know, that it needs to be in those uh, large connections, we use that, that device to manage the internet. So we don't slow down anybody's services. We manage the packets as they come in so that if customer A is asking for X amount of packets and customer B is not using them, that difference shares over. So everybody has a level playing field. Unfortunately, that type of management of packets is to be considered slowing down. As in, we are in 
we are slowing down the open internet portion. So we know that we are going to have to shut down that piece of equipment. Okay. So the clear language, language contained in that Title II net neutrality rules will place us in a position to not be able to manage that bandwidth anymore. We can't continue with that here in the very, very, very near future. Um, April 13th was the FCC registry ruling. Um, we have to comply within 60 days. And trust me, we want to comply because if we don't, the fines are enormous. They are very, very ugly. So this presents us with meeting this ruling or this law by June 12th of 2015. Um, we will make adjustments and changes to our system no later than June 1st. We, we really need to get ourselves on top of this. Um, and we need to in anticipate the impact that's going to have on our customers and ourselves. So after much discussion with Joe, we know we have to turn this piece of equipment off. You know, and it's not a resolution-based thing. It's a law. We have to shut this thing down. So we have the capacity available to do what we want to do. We have the capacity going to our customers. Where we are going to get a catch-22 is we have a bottleneck situation on um, at our substations where all this data gets transferred through, like the ports at the subs are only rated at X. And we have that maxed out to the top. Okay? So what we could theoretically see is a section of town, or or maybe not, we don't know yet how this is going to play out, where the bandwidth consumption is exceedingly high and those data packets start falling off. You know, it's not like a power system where if the load exceeds the wire's rating, the breaker opens up and turns everybody off. You know, or the wire melts down. In this, in this data world, when you exceed the available capacity of the equipment, it just drops packets. It says, okay, we, if you need 100 and I can only get 50 through, the other 50 just go into Neverland, and now you get that proverbial little thing on your screen that spins and says mm -hmm. buffering. That's what, what you're seeing. Um, Joe, Joe has been working diligently on looking at... Um, if when we turn this piece of equipment down, does it make sense to look at the next level of another 500 megabyte Ethernet connection to the world? If it does, then what's it going to take to get today's equipment that we have to the next step? And does it make sense to go to the next step? So there's a lot going on here. But what we're bringing to you, and, and Joe and I talked, we want to do this early. And that's why we're doing this meeting, talking about it, getting it to the public. I mean, they own us. That we are going to turn this thing off. And we'll probably talk about it at the next meeting again. Hey, this is what we're doing. June 1st at midnight, we're shutting this, this, this piece of equipment down. Unless this manufacturer and the American Cable Association and these other groups can get a stay on the FCC ruling, it's going to happen. We're going to turn it off. Or if they can get some kind of legal opinion that says, well, that's really not, that's really not throttling back. That's managing stuff. I don't think that's going to happen, but I'm just saying if it did, we would be, you know, better. But I think what's going to happen for sure, we are going to turn it off. We're going to see how the system reacts to this piece of equipment shut down. And then we're going to have some challenges we're going to have to tackle in the future. You know, we're going to have, I don't know what the challenges will be. We may not have any, but I think we'll have some. We're going to have to figure out how we can spread some of this around this need around, and I don't know if we can do it. So, I'm, like I said, we're bringing it to the community, we're bringing it to you guys. Uh, you know, we're, we're, as Joe and I were talking, we're sort of against the wall. We don't have a choice in the matter. If it was our choice, we'd stay with the Persera, we'd probably upgrade the Persera to even a better one to help manage packets more efficiently, but it, we're not there. You ever so, had experience with anything with this, Joe? You have to, you have to, so you have an idea what the consequences are going to be? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so I get, I get the well, feeling I guess we, if we have to shut that equipment off. Well, we're, we're well here's, here's what's going to happen. You want to step up? Uh, Joe, when you step up to the podium so the mics can pick you okay. up. Okay. Okay. Make it easier for Max to write okay. his <laughs> the, good, the, the good news of this whole thing is, is that we've been running utilization tests for a long time to see how much stress the customer usage is placing on our CMTS router. 
A lot of customers don't use that much bandwidth at one given time. But there are times when a lot of people use quite a bit of bandwidth off of one port. And we have situations to where if you have, the way our ports are designed, if you have four customers that max out their connections at one given time, they could absolutely max out that port and basically flatline that bandwidth that's coming to everybody off that. And some of these ports have 100 or more internet customers off that port. So, the, so when you run the math, it doesn't work. But a lot of times, like I said, a lot of people aren't using a lot. But what's, what I anticipate happening is that when we remove, remove this restriction on this preserve device, what's going to happen is people, currently the way it works is when somebody tries to stream video, whether it's Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, Amazon Prime or any of those. We have worked for the last two years to keep tweaking that to where people could get that service and not go into buffering and drop connections, etc., especially on Netflix. And we and we fine-tuned that and we've got it to, if you want to call it a sweet spot now. Well, what's going to happen is right now the way it is is when you stream one of these videos. You are not downloading the entire video at one time. You are buffering and streaming the content a little farther ahead than what you're actually doing. When we open this up, what will happen is if someone clicks on a YouTube video, I'll give that for an example, there's a good possibility that they will, because some YouTube videos are designed that you download the entire video at one time. As fast as your internet connection will deliver it, it will go to your home. Okay, that is what's going to tax our system and tax the ports. If you are a internet, a casual internet user, you're doing web browsing. You're not using very much bandwidth at all. If your neighbor down the street, who's off the same port out of the substation as you, they are using their maximum connection. They've got the, they've got two smart TVs. They have smartphones, tablets, everything going at one time. You've got two or three of those off of that connection and they're taxing that. What's going to happen is that port will not have the capacity to deliver all that bandwidth to everyone. And not only the people who are putting stress on that will slow down, the people doing web browsing will slow down. When you start losing so many packets, there is a threshold that when you lose down to a certain number of packets per millisecond, you will, your video streaming will drop out. It will totally drop it. It will go to buffering or it will totally drop and disconnect. We don't know, I have no idea yet, what each port and all four substations is going to do when we, when we make this change. And Brian said something earlier about June 1st. We need to make a change in late May. Uh, because it's not as simple as throwing a switch. All of this management is done with configuration. Configuration has to be set up between ourselves, our, um, our hardware provider, and a couple of other folks out there, and we have to do it. And, and uh, the best of my knowledge, we have to do it all at once. It's like we can't go to a section of town. We, we, we need to do it for, for everyone because it's all set up on the, on the main subnets. Um, so that's what's happening. The only solution to it is we have to, as a utility, decide how much capital dollars that we can afford to or want to spend to upgrade to the next level. That will take a few months to get done. If I submit for another big Ethernet connection to take care of the bandwidth that's needed, if we could get it to the customer, it's a minimum of about two months, it's been about two months for my main carrier to even think about getting it activated. Then on top of that, we have to purchase all this equipment, get it installed, configured, and then the customers have to have new cable modems, all of those that have the older style modems, we have to, that's an expense. Um, so it's... Joe, and that's, that's if we went to the next step. If, if we go to the next step. Not yes. currently as we are today. No, currently we are, everybody's fine. Yeah. So. 
it, it, it's coming down to with this tier two, how the FCC looks at it. You know, it's very similar to what uh, Verizon and some of the other big phone carriers did several years back. You know, everybody used to have unlimited data, unlimited voice, unlimited text, unlimited everything. And then uh, your Verizons of the world, the bigger guys are going, wow, you know, we got all this expense in infrastructure to keep this unlimited everything. We're going to start throttling people back. We're going to say the average person uses this much, and this is what you're going to get for this price. But if you want anything more, you're going to pay this much more. It's setting itself up for the communication world in the, in the sense of the ISP world to start doing that. You see it right now, and I, I stand on my soapbox on this. You see it now in the power world at, with transmission and PJM and all the RTOs. You see it in the gas world on how the transmission and the gas works. It just makes sense that the business model is already there, mm -hmm. that someone's driving it to this direction. So. so it sounds to me like we're looking at some difficult times, but if people will just hang with us, we'll get that fixed. We, we, we will address, right, yes, we'll, we'll address, as you tell in the board, of, of what, what we need to do to address the situation. I might add also that the the ACA, the NCTA, and, and and Verizon and several folks out there are are filing lawsuits and petitions against the FCC to place a stay on this rule. However, every single petition that they're asking for to put a stay on the rule is only for the old Title II regulations from the old telephone days 80 years ago, like Brian told you, and it's not about open internet access. The open internet access portion of it is what affects us. No operator is contesting that because they're all very large and they have, they're very large, they just have massive amounts of bandwidth to deliver, so it's, it's not affecting them. Is the extra bandwidth available to us if we get to the point we decide we... Well, the point is, the, the choking point is the, this, how do I say it? Um, the bandwidth we can purchase, but it may not help us. So it's like taking a 12 inch water line and throttling it down to a 3 quarter inch water line and bringing it back to 12 inch. Is what we have going right now. It's the bottleneck. So your bottleneck is that that small portion of water line is not letting signal through or whatever through. So we have all this capacity that we can bring into Brian. If Joe gets it secured, you know, and we spend the money and we have a monthly fee for a full 1 gig connection to the world, you know, we have yay capacity, but we have a bottleneck to get it to the customer. And then from the customer asking for capacity, as in out to the world, is a bottleneck. we got to get the bottleneck opened up. But the bottleneck to open it up is considerable expense. So in the process, that's what this Percera piece of equipment did. It managed that bottleneck so that everybody got a fair piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be the case in June, or sooner, my bad Joe, sooner. What we have been working on for the last three months is putting together some... Um, return on investment numbers and looking at, okay, if we spend X amount of dollars, how does this work out? What's the payback? What's, what kind of customer retention do we need to have to make it payback? I mean, Joe's, Joe's getting beat up on this bad daily. In fact, I threw another curveball today because he brought me some initial numbers. I'm like, these are like, okay, let's talk about this. Now let's figure out if we lost 500 customers, 200 customers, 100 customers. <laughs> so now you're back to the drawing board making this spreadsheet even bigger. But I'm going to look at the, the whole picture. Does it make sense? We're not crying the end of the world. No. We're not saying this is our system's bad. Our system is what it was designed for at that time for the public. Mm -hmm. You know, technology moves fast. Utilities don't move so fast. Right. So we got to figure out what we can offer that makes sense for our customers to meet their needs the best that we can. To bring it to you guys tonight was not to 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 cry wolf or cry fire. It's Hey, folks, this is what's coming. And when, if people holler, and the Brian Times has done some articles on net neutrality. If you follow the internet, there's a bunch of stuff about it. I would suggest reading up on it. It's rather interesting. So, thank we, you, Jim. Okay, we just want the public to know, and you folks to know, so if you get calls from customers that, that, that what we're facing 
and when we get ready, when we get ready to make a change, uh, we'll we'll schedule that well ahead of time, and you know Brian will be Brian will be advising you and so forth. And we want, and basically, we don't want to make a big issue out of it. We want to be a just basically behind the scenes doing mm -hmm. what we do in the head end, and we just we make our changes and see what it does. Yeah. People are not going to drop off a cliff in one day. No. So, and we are not. 100% against net neutrality, and we're not 100% for net neutrality. We do fall truly in the middle because there are some things about being considered a utility that are very beneficial to us in the future if things play out the right way. But this is the side that hurts us right now. So, nice job, Joe, and yeah, thank, thank you, you for the, the summary. The third time <laughs> we were going back and forth quite a bit on it. We uh, had a very short council meeting last night, but uh, I did tell council that uh, Danieras called me uh, last week uh, mm -hmm. to remind us that uh, a few, and this is a water tower week, if they can look up and see 1840, and this is a, be 175 years for the city. Their, uh, their plans are around the Jubilee to, to do something, however the theme of the Jubilee has already been set. And it, it doesn't uh, involve 175 years, but uh, just a thought out there, if anyone makes a float or anything of that nature, maybe 175 years could be put on there, something of that nature. But 1840 to 2015 is 175 years so, for our city. Did I hear it correctly that the fountain will be turned on this week? I haven't heard, as cold as it is, maybe they're waiting, but I have not heard officially. No, I'm not. Is that what we heard the fountain will the be fountain? turned on this week? No, I haven't heard a firm date. Okay. Then we, don't we, put that we in favor. Turned the supply, <laughs> we turned the supply on to it, but as far as the final. Official so. turn on, okay. What's the official freeze date? Um, is it May 5th? Second week of May. May, yeah. <laughs> We're done freeze. freezing, Mayor. We're done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Been outside. laughs> That's about it. This one. Thank you. Laura? No, ma'am. Al? No. Karen? No. No, I just wanted to say I, the, the water presentation was good. Uh, you know, and people need to realize how important that is, that we, we take care of that. You know, it seems like the longer I've been on the board, the more I read about it, uh, the more you see the, the potential risks and what we have to deal with to take care of it. Um, we have a couple of um, meetings coming up that I just wanted to remind people of. Um, the, um, based on the feedback that I received, we're going to be moving um, the director's evaluation to January so that it'll be in line with, with everyone else's evaluation as opposed to being in June. Or June? Yes. June, okay. Um, the other thing is, is um, we're going to be scheduling our planning meeting earlier this year so that they can um, use that for their budget. And we're talking about doing it um, after the second quarterly report comes out and we've had a chance to look at that. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Uh -huh. Second. Al? Yes. Karen? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Jim? Yes. Thank you.